So the Karachi Zoo um, revival concept actually is a part of the general beautification of the city projects. There's 20 plus projects that have been earmarked and uh, funds allocated for them by the government, um, predominantly um, uh, engined uh, and steered by Murad Ali Shah, he's the man behind making sure that these things happen. And the Karachi Zoo uh, was one of those projects that, that got thrown into the list of things that would be a part of the beautification of the city. The interesting thing about that is that the Karachi Zoo is often forgotten. When you think about beautification of the city, you think about we need more street lights, you think about bringing down the billboards, you think about you know better road networks, um, drainage, sewage, uh, more parks, you know, the condition of the trees. The, the zoo often gets forgotten. So in various conversations with Murad Ali Shah and Samar Ali Khan, uh, Samar had suggested that the Karachi Zoo be part of the city beautification projects. The Karachi Zoo being built in 1878 is a very important piece of Karachi's heritage and urban history. So the fact that finally some light is being shed on it, it's fantastic. It's really a beautiful project. We're in the middle of projects that are almost entirely infrastructure based. There is this one project which is this jewel-like living organism uh, that has lots of history. It has complexities, it has sensitivities, it has, um, a, it's, it's a gorgeous little oasis in the middle of the heart of the old city in Karachi, in the Garden East, where there's high rises coming up, there's pollution, there's noise, there's encroachment with shops, and then you come through the gates of the Karachi Zoo, even today, before the redesign has happened, and it's, it's this idyllic, you hear the birds, you hear the animals, there are trees there. Um, we've recently got a list of 2,000 trees of which over 300, 400 of them are over 100, 150 years old. Trees, many trees that there is only a few specimens in Pakistan are in there. So we have the heritage of this space to look at. There's also the heritage of the trees that are there to look at. So the project has really been born at government level. It's not, and, and then it trickled through the system, through Samar Ali Khan, through a team of people working on Karachi's beautification said, we need somebody who, is an architect who has a passion for animals, has, is an empath, empath of that nature and I think it just sort of, I inherited it, uh, trickle down format of some nature and I get to now uh, monitor the project from start to finish. So the zoo is a, is a really enigmatic uh, project. My first visit to the zoo was really eye-opening. I expected it to be in a deplorable condition. I expected to see starving, bleeding, uh, unhappy, miserable, ferocious, sickly animals. I expected to see no grass and no trees. And I was pleasantly surprised that given uh, a lack of human resource, given the uh, ground realities of the fact that it is run by KMC it has, it's a government entity, it's not a private run organization. It obviously comes with its own set of issues. And given those issues, those conditions, what I refer to as ground realities, so that there's no real unnecessary um, imposition and imperialist negativity on it, it was a pleasant surprise. Having said that, of course it needs help. The awam and the, you know, the spitting of the pan, the climbing of the cages, the hurtling of uh, boxes of juice and bottles of uh, fizzy drinks, um, pan wrappers, this continues to happen. And that's an, that's an issue we have to address in terms of the zoo's role as an educational institution. Right? If we can use it to continue an informal education, for the inner city visitors. The zoo gets a lot of visitors. Even now, I have to say that it's not a neglected environment. We think it's neglected, but it gets a lot of footfall now. It is enough space, it has enough information, it has enough inspiration there, I believe, that we could increase the footfall. And I'm hoping that with the uh, launch of this project, not only will we increase the footfall, we will also increase the diversity of footfall and the profile of visitors. So that when you have a different set of visitors, then maybe they can learn from each other. Maybe one set will say, oh, you look, you know, you don't have to throw pan, you don't have to misbehave like this. We can hopefully, with giving enough information about the way the animals live, 
and how they should be treated, where they come from, what their natural lives are like in these newly designed natural habitats, it will hopefully create the empathy by into in the visitor who right now looks at the animal and thinks that it's meant to be kept in a cage. Maybe this is how it's kept. Maybe it's no different than a chicken before it's sacrificed or a goat or a duck or a you know farm animal. It doesn't realize that these animals are very special, very different um, and they have to be handled, handled very differently and uh, the engagement between them has to be different. So I, I'm hoping that with, with a whole new set of um, information specs for the animals, for the enclosures, um, a, a new SOP for the management of the new systems that we'll put into place so that it's not only design that looks beautiful and design which is comfortable for the inhabitants but it also is educational for the visitors to see that this is how the animals would normally live and this is how they should be handled and treated. So the animal enclosures which is where our original focus began is to start this off as a cage to enclosure shift in design. That was the brief I was given. Can we please uh, find an alternative way of keeping these animals that is not cages, but let's look at enclosures. Now enclosures are normally designed, inspired by the animal, that particular species natural habitat. So you first of all, you take the little space that it's in and you say, right, we're gonna give you a much larger space. Then the whole pinjra factor will be removed. So suddenly, the same animal will be in an environment where there's more room to move around. Usko jaga milegi ghumne phirne ke liye. Usko mukhtalif terrains milenge. Uski landscaping hui bhi hogi. Uska jo environment hoga, wo ab flat cement or tiles or jungle ka nahi hoga. Usme khuli chhat milegi. Usko asman dekhne ko milega. Darakht honge, patthar honge, pani hoga. Is kisam ki cheeze honge. Or because because of that, it will that animal will get to be in a more comfortable environment where they have more things to do. So that's the first part of it. The second thing is that there are still captive animals. So if I take an animal in a small environment and give him a beautiful, colorful, larger environment, they will sniff it and explore it for X amount of time, after which they might still get bored. So what we're doing is saying that fine, if this animal is going to live in a rockery or a jungle or a, a, a savanna type environment, what can we provide that animal with that keeps it engaged intellectually? So the design is aiming, I mean we're trying to do it, is aiming to be a smart home set up, what we call intelligent enclosures, so that the enclosure itself will be climatically defined. The animal has different places to go in different seasons, which he doesn't have right now. Right? So we're not doing this carte blanche of one look throughout the enclosure. The enclosure will have climatic uh, design differences. Garmi mein haan chale jayen, sardi mein haan chale jayen, spring mein haan chale jayen, paani hoga, open jaga hogi, band jaga hogi, dark spaces, light spaces, flat places to climb, vagera, whatever they need. And then potentially some movement. Can there be toys? Can there be loose furniture in this environment that the animal can engage with and move around, throw, roll around with, move inside, sit on top, shift over the course of the day, over the course of the week. And so the fact that it's been, the design is being basically inspired by the Rubik's Cube. So a Rubik's Cube is not an enormous amount of number of toys for a child growing up to play with. It's a tiny little piece of real estate. It has a finite number of things you can manipulate and yet it's hours and hours of pleasure that is no different than any other more complex game that has many more moving parts. So taking the concept of the Rubik's Cube, we said we need to give them an environment which is the same. It's a limited amount of real estate, it's a limited amount of moving parts, but how many permutations and combinations can that animal have so that it's kept as psychologically engaged as possible. So us janwar ki aap jitni bhi boredom kam karenge, wo utna khush rahega. There are tricks that we will also train um, the keepers on how to keep their scent system functioning, how to get them simulations for hunting for food, because all of these animals are almost like pets. They get food at a given time of day. The whole hunting mechanism has been subdued. So we'll keep that alive also. 
the more they smell, the more they hunt, the more they search, dig through the ground, will keep them happy. And these are enrichment programs which the zoo doesn't have right now. So I'm hoping that our, our um, design will actually have this intelligent design, intelligent enclosure system in it, to allow for some enrichment programs that are within the enclosure, its habitat and the animal. Yes, so the cages will be removed as much as possible. The birds will obviously still need to be in a very big cage, not the smaller cages. So the cage, you see the cage is um, suffocating because of its size. If you make that same cage very, very big and you allow animals movement and the freedom of movement, freedom of exploration, it also allows them the freedom of activity, engagement and expression. Right? They are more comfortable in that environment than as visitors, as children, as students, you get to see them behaving closer to how they should behave as opposed to how they're behaving now where they're in cramped quarters. So there will be the monkeys, for instance, will not, we can't give them an open roof. They will be in a giant monkey house, which will be multiple types of jungle gyms in it so that the primates are as uh, stimulated in their minds as possible. They're the closest to us. They're sensitive, they're emotional, uh, they're noisy, they want attention, they want contact, they're community creatures, they're social beings. So all of that will have to be provided for them in a large environment so they don't get a sense of the cage. Where we can, the cages will be replaced by just fencing, low fence, high fence, moats, so your visibility as a visitor is better for, to the animals and they get a sense of freedom. Security is obviously a big issue. We don't want humans falling into the enclosure closures. We don't want the animals getting out. So the type of enclosure design for birds is different, monk primates is different, for the hooved animals, herbivores is different, for the carnivores is different, elephants, completely different. One of the things that we've had, um, and there's been a, there's been a lot of criticism uh, for this project, and um, I have to answer critical questions on a daily basis. One of the things that shows up is that how will you, how will you keep uh, the elephants who require 30 kilometers a day walking space? Well, there are elephants all over the world in excellent zoos that are provided with enough things to do so they don't miss their 30 kilometers walk every day, first of all. Secondly, it's, an, it's a very um, unfair assumption that that elephant has been picked from an entirely wild life and brought here. Most animals that are in zoos have come from trade, from other zoos, or they've been born in captivity elsewhere. So they're, they're, they are wild in nature and in instinct, but they're not wild in the lifestyle that they've come from. And that element one looks at in terms of conservation. Would any one of these animals be in a better condition in the hands of poachers, for instance, if I was to release them uh, somewhere in the wildlife? Would they be better in a sanctuary? Uh, what would our children, the same Awam who brings their children in and they throw things at these animals, how would they have the opportunity of learning? Right? We would lose the educational element entirely. So our idea is not to say necessarily that zoos are good. Zoos worldwide are either turning into enclosures or turning into safaris or they're shutting down. Eventually maybe that will be part of our evolution at all as well. But for now, the Karachi Zoo uh, is being designed with a sort of crisis management in mind. These animals need immediate attention. Shutting it down is not a rational, feasible, logical, or even cost-effective suggestion or solution. Where would I move them to? Who would look after them better than we can right now? At least at the moment, we have the opportunity to work with a management who is uh, very, very cooperative, they're providing us with all the information we require. They're providing us with time, effort, human resources. I have yet to have any kind of resistance from the government, local government, from the KMC, from the zoo management, from any of these people. They've received my team with open arms. We have an excellent partnership in terms of sharing of information, sharing of grievances. They have very openly told us what problems they suffer and asked us for our help in terms of management systems, SOPs, moving this forward. Very clearly, I've been told that you have seen that we have how many problems we have at this time, we manage it. Minimal resource, minimal fund, etc. Minimal expertise even. There is a PC-1 that's been uh, released 
that has a whole list of new attractions, new animals, exotic animals in it. Um, I'm not sure if the new design will have space to accommodate all of them, but we will try and accommodate as many as possible, at least the big species that are uh, the most crucial parts to calling it a zoo. Um, and they will probably happen after the enclosures are completed so that the animals arrive and the space is ready to receive them as opposed to now where if any of the new attractions were to be brought in as trade or purchase or whatever it may be we don't have the setup for them so i'm going to get all the design done first for our existing animals leaving accommodation for new attractions and then let the government purchase them in their own time afterwards if they really have to <laughs>